Hello and how are you to so sports lovers out there? My name is Robbie Gillette. Welcome to conversation number 24 of the Keeping It Real with Robbie podcast, where we chat all things on the mental side of sport, to stories, laughs and banter, whether into the old pigskin or the old leather ball, we've got you. Today I'm joined by Proteus and Knights batsman Pat from Blue, as we discuss his 14-year domestic journey in cricket to his Proteus debut. Pat didn't shy away from expressing his opinion on various topics relevant at the moment with regards to Cricket South Africa, which is something I deeply admire about him. Something I took away from the, from the chat with Pite was to try and understand the perspective of a sportsman when there's a mistake made or before casting judgment or, or criticizing him. Um, you know, Pite made a brilliant comparison between uh, the job of a journalist and the job of a, of a professional sportsman, especially a cricketer and a batsman uh, when there's a mistake made. Um, in cricket, there's no backspace uh, and there's 50 million people watching you. Um, so I thought, you know, that kind of put it into perspective of what, or, or, you know, when you try cast judgment or there's punditry happening, to try maybe understand that perspective a little bit better. Pied also reassured me that Mark Boucher and his coaching staff, as well as the pro teams, are leaving no stone unturned to try and win us this World Cup at the end of 2021. I hope you guys enjoy, and as always, let me know what you guys think. Cool. The hot streak of guests keeps continuing. Uh, VKB Knights and Protoss Batsman, Thief of Shoes, the Protoss' very own Skulk Brits and stalwart Pite van Bouillon. Pite, thanks for joining me. I know you, you're you probably out oh, at 3 o'clock on a Sunday. You're probably in line for a bit of a Sunday nap, uh, but you took some time out to chat to me, so I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. lots, lots to unpack uh, in there, um, but I think maybe let's start with uh, Shamsi's shoe. I, I thought it was phenomenal chat. Um, yeah, so maybe can you talk us through that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a interesting one. I probably got wrapped over the knuckles a little bit afterwards. Um, the game was quite dense. The guys were getting pretty heated. Um, Shamza Shamo was taking off both shoes and throwing them, and you know, going all over the place. And he got a wicket, so it was quite tense in the huddle. So I just thought, look. I didn't think about it, but I just thought, look, we need a little bit of smile on the faces here. You know, we, we've got a wicket now, let's, let's try and put some pressure on them. So, yeah, no, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, something that I thought of. I just saw the shoe lying there and I thought, no, maybe this would be a smile on the face. <laughs> and, and did it work? Um, I think Shabba was all right after that. The, 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 the nerves kind of settled and the emotions settled after that. But uh, we, I think we got fined like 20% of our match fees for slow over rate. So that probably didn't help. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think let's maybe start with your journey because it, it's, it's quite a fascinating one, I think, and one that's not very um, like conventional, if you get what I'm saying. Um, where, where does your journey begin, like in terms of cricket? Look, I, I played all the sports at primary school, cricket, hockey, rugby, tennis, athletic, everything. I, my, I think my parents tried to expose me to as much as possible. Um, but I think my love for cricket probably started when I was 12, 13 ish, when I got some success, got picked for a, a free state provincial team. Um, my dad was obviously always very keen to throw balls, to help, to coach, to learn, you know, so he kind of pushed pushed me in that direction as well. So I'd say probably the age of between 10 and 13 is where the cricket journey started for me. And, and I, 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 when I was obviously doing a bit of research, I saw that you actually come from quite a, a sporty family. Yeah, my, my dad um, was an international athlete. Um, probably his best sport, he has international colours in a few sports, um, no. but probably based in modern pentathlon. Um, I used to argue with him quite a lot over my cricket and like he'd say do this do that and I'd be like no ways it's not how it's done why should I listen to you what, 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 what. and then one day I got uh, there by the, by, the, by the bar area I found a, a big shoe box full of newspaper articles and um, he was rated the second best in the world at one stage um, so yeah then I kind of realized look maybe I should just yeah. be quiet and listen a little bit um, and then my sister has been a, a double Olympic swimmer so yeah, pretty sporty family. Um, I'm probably the worst out of the lot, to be honest. <laughs> that yeah, that's that that's quite something to wrap my head around. But um, yeah, I've got so much respect for for swimmers. I'm I'm busy doing my my sports science degree at at um, Stelly's, and mm -hmm. we had to do like swimming as a practical. And I think we had to do eight lengths in a row or something. And I <laughs> to, to say that I just got there without drowning was yeah, I know. <laughs> 
like we, we are supposed to be fit and um, I had a shoulder up this year and I'm meant to do like swimming for my rehab and stuff. And um, I barely get through five lengths and, you know, <laughs> continuous. So five lengths is lengths. a lot. I would run. <laughs> <laughs> so you played 14 years of first class cricket, which is a long time. Uh, before you got your pro test debut, how do you, how do you reflect on those 14 years? I would say probably I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've got um, and that I've been given opportunities for longer periods of time than some of my competitors or some of my teammates. Um, I don't know why. Maybe I've hang, hanged in there a little bit longer as well. You know, I didn't throw the tail in you know, when I got dropped. I, I always kind of like fought my way back into a team. Um, so I'm very grateful for 14 years of first class cricket. It hasn't always been plain sailing. Um, in and out of a lot of teams on the way, started at Northerns, moved to EP, back to Free State. So it hasn't always been an easy road, but uh, I think I've learned a lot of life lessons from cricket and, and, and it's served me well. Mm. And did you always think you'll be a pro tier? Was there always that? Are there I always the hoped. Like, yeah, yeah. There were some tough times um, playing amateur cricket, mm. you know, not getting a look in, probably not scoring as many runs as what I hoped for. Um, not things not going my way, so you'd always then hope, but the doubt do start coming in as you get older. You get to 27, 28, 29, you see the next under 19 kid is in the newspapers, he's all over the TV. Yeah. So you think, well, this guy's going to be the next guy in, you know. So, um, I wouldn't say I, I ever gave up. I mean, every night, well, every night, but I, I still dreamt about playing cricket for South Africa and I still prepared. You know, to face the best in the world, if I can put it like that, or watch what they do, and how will I play if I have to face Stark and Cummins and all these guys? So, or yeah. well, back then it was probably uh, Morne and Dale and the boys. So, you now I've, I've always prepared myself to to be ready to play international cricket. Um, but yeah, it hasn't always obviously worked out how I planned. Mm. And so, who who would you have entered like like with your schoolboy days? Who would you have entered into professional cricket with? The guys, um, the guys who have probably gone on to play for South Africa from my years were guys like Richard Levy, um, Wayne Bonnell is a little bit younger than me, um, Stian van Sel is probably a year or two younger than me, uh, Peter Milan, um, Dean Algo is a year younger than me. I played a lot of cricket uh, with, with Dean. So yeah, that, that group, um, that group, I, I didn't play SA 19 or SA schools, but I played a lot of SA universities cricket. And um, I think I played five years at University Cricket and every year I think we played SA under 19. So I got to see a lot of those guys play with or against a lot of those guys, yeah. And am I right in saying you did a, a law degree? I did uh, become Law in Pretoria and uh, Honours in Financial Planning in Port Elizabeth. Or while playing, I'm playing cricket? Yeah, while well, playing cricket, um, my marks uh, will reflect that as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need. You a take lot of rewrites. There was a lot of rewrites that just scraped. I don't know how I scraped through. I think I just made my handwriting so bad that the lecture just gave me the points. <laughs> so no, it wasn't easy. No, that's that's so impressive. And uh, you know, like the impression I always get from first class cricket is that it's it's incredibly like tough and unforgiving. Um, there's no, there's hardly ever any crowds. Is it a fair assessment to say that? Um, and have you ever, like, what kind of tough experience have you taken from first class cricket? Not necessarily in games, but like, as you say, not getting a look in, in and out of contracts, um, you know, those kind of periods. I think, yes, first class cricket is hard and it is, uh, it's a professional sport. So it's, yeah, all the teams will pick guys because they want to win, you know. So there's not really um, the. The nature of our contracts is also um, max two-year contracts, or it has been up to now. So, if you have a bad season, you know you might not get a look in again, or a bad competition, you might not get a look in again because the next guy is always coming through. You know? So, mm. with a franchise system also in place, it was only six teams um, that was competing at the you no know, the tier just below international cricket, and then you have to go to amateur cricket or, or senior provincial, which was a, a step or two down from the standard you were playing against. Um, well, at most of the time at franchise level, the franchise level, you'll play every game, you'll play against the odd pro tier or two, um, and then you go down to amateur level, and it could be a club ground that you play at, uh, guys you've never seen before. So 
yeah, it's quite a tough. It was quite a tough environment in the in the previous structure, uh, but it's a new structure now, obviously. So yeah, we'll see what it, what it brings. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, like, so first class cricket, and you say like you play in a club grounds. Um, how how do those pitches vary? You know, like if you in terms of like you playing at Newlands or then you go to Western Province Cricket Club, it's not going to be the same pitch because Newlands will be more looked after. You know, did you ever find that as a bit of a struggle? It's uh, definitely a lot harder. Um, I, I find it harder playing uh, senior provincial um, because when you play at Newlands, the ground has. A definite characteristic. If you play Wanderers, the pitch has a definite characteristic that you can prepare for. Um, you know, in a week leading up to the game or in two weeks leading up to the game. If you play at a club ground, it's it could have been raining, it could have been a, a dry season that, that you had, and you're not quite sure what to expect. How do you prepare? Yeah. And it's not just the conditions that's unknown. Um, the opposition's unknown as well because I mean, if I go back to playing the Cobras, my first game, I knew. What do you expect from Rory Glanfeld, Dane Patterson, um, Justin Kim, Dane Pitt? I knew exactly. I saw them on TV. I saw them for yeah. years. On TV. Now you play some, you know, uh, on a club ground, it might be a bit difficult. We get some student comes in there. It's his first game for Western Province. And you don't know what to expect. The first one's a full banger. The next one's a Yorker and you're out, you know. So, yeah. no, I find it really hard to, to, to play senior provincial cricket now. What do you think of the new um, structure? Do you think it's better than the old one in terms of opportunity? I'm not sure if it's better. Look, there's, I think there was a massive debate before the structure was on because they said something like 70 contracts will be lost because you'll go from you know two or three teams per region to two teams per region. So yes, contracts lost. So that means you lose professional players that you know were playing cricket for a living. Um, but then again, you have more players playing at a higher level, if I can put yes. it like that. Yeah. So, um, for me, the region I'm from, Free State, I think we've always wanted to have our own identity. Um, we've always wanted to have our own team. Um, we've got a very strong culture with a, a rich heritage of, of cricketers coming through. And in the franchise system, obviously with Northern Cape having exactly the same, just on their side. So, yeah. um, I think both our unions, Free State and Northern Cape, would have welcomed the, the split into provincial into a provincial structure. Okay, okay. And in the fourteen years of first class cricket, what, what are some of the best memories like that instantly stand out? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, I'd say the first one that stands out is I think my second game. I made 190 against uh, North, against Kriquas or Northern Cape back then, and I think guys who um, I played with Neil Wagner was. One of our bowlers, no um, uh, Pierre Hubert, who's like the interim CEO at Titans now. He was my captain, so um, obviously to do it in front of them would have, was was a great experience. But definitely the one in first loss cricket that stands out for me was my debut for the Knights was against the Cobras at Newlands. I was I made a hundred on debut and man of the match, and we won for the first time. I think it was in seventeen years or something that we won a four day game at Newlands. So that's quite a special. Special game for me to be a part of, yeah. <laughs> I laugh at um, Neil Neil Wagner, but because whenever the like the New Zealand commentator is Wagner, and all well, mates and I are just like, oh, it's so it's like it's not Wagner. No, it's, <laughs> it's just no. horrible. <laughs> I text him. I text him often. I grew up with. I grew up playing against that guy from under thirteen. Yeah. All the way. We went to University of Pretoria, played with him there. And I'm like, and I, I said to him, Bachis, um, <laughs> exactly. I'm speak, Bachis, like it's not yet. Bachis, I'm not going to speak English to you. I'm going to speak Afrikaans. <laughs> and he tried to mean English, but I'm going to speak Afrikaans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wagner, Wagner, we're just like, mm, it's not. No, it's Wagner. not. <laughs> and then, so you, may, you make your approaches, Davey, which is obviously incredibly special. Uh, but it seems to have come at a bit of a turbulent time for CSA uh, for various reasons. Um, has this affected you in any way? Um, I think the the turbulence at at CSI is, if I'm honest, probably given me an opportunity um, to come in and, and play a couple of games. Um, there's a lot of unsurety. A lot of players are unsure what's going to happen. Um, a lot of players that I've been working with or, or played with is affected by it. You know, and 
and they get affected in a bad way and they, you know, they kind of lose concentration, you know, in the domestic setups and the MSLs and all that because they're unsure of what's going to happen where I kind of had an advantage. Well, nothing's really going to change in my life because I'm just a franchise player. I'm, con- I'm still contracted at the Knights. Um, this is the MSL. It's just a great opportunity for me to show what I can do. And then luckily I've I'd, I had a, probably my last three or four years have been very good domestic seasons and, um, lucky that one or two guys stepped out, uh, A.B. De Villiers, one of them, and probably opened up a spot for me for a couple of games. So, yeah, look, the turmoil is not ideal, but, you know, I try not to look into that too much because, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to change anything what happens at boardroom level or sponsorship level. The best I can do is to hit a cover drive and, and hopefully stop the ball at cover. So that's the best I can do, yeah. What what do you put the the best four seasons now uh, down to? Like personally, what do you what do you think it is? So again, sorry. What do you think your uh, your like you said you had four good years? What do you put that down to? Yes, yeah, so it's it's difficult to say. Um, I was always I remember my I think my third or fourth year contracted. I had I was finished fourth leading run scorer in the country and only played like seven or eight games. Um, and I knew that that was kind of like a watershed moment for me where I knew, okay, look, I can compete at this level. I've, you know, I've played with and against Cookie, who was like before the leading run scorer in the country that year, and he just got his call up into the test team. So I knew, look, I can probably compete at this level. And then, but I was still in and out of the teams. You know, we had Dennis De Bruyne, David Miller, uh, Rudy Second, um, you know, very good batters around. So although I was doing well, they were also doing well. So you're not just, so I need, if you if you want to level down, you need the guy ahead of you to do badly as well for you to take your spot. So um, you need to do your <coughs> bit and that guy needs to do badly. Otherwise, you're still going to sit on the bench. So I'd say when those guys left, um, I became captain of the Knights and was probably sure of a spot in the team. Um, yeah. So I could play with a little bit more freedom. Um, I've always been relatively consistent but maybe just not seeing as consistent because you get two or three games a year. So if you get two or three games a season and you make 150, that's actually not a bad season, you know. But yes, if yeah. you play 15 games and you make 550s, then guys are saying, oh, he's top of the charts in the runs, you know, top five in the runs, you know, this guy must play. So, yeah, I'd probably say a little bit more consistency in the teams, probably in the public eye um, yeah. escalated me, yeah. Okay, sure. That's interesting. Um I'm just going to read a quick thread that I think your teammate, Ferran Bell, didn't put out on Twitter, just about the what's happening with CSA, just for the guys at home. Um, I'll put it up for you on YouTube or I'll, for the guys listening on Apple Podcasts, I'll read it out for you. But he said, uh, when the Honorable Minister intervenes, he will most likely strip CSA as governing body, a governing authority for cricket in our country, which means the protest men's and women's sides won't be recognized as national teams. The ICC... We'll review our full member status and potentially bar us from playing any international cricket, which means our men's T20 World Cup participation in October, together with the Women's World Cup in February, will be in jeopardy, let alone bilateral cricket. When this happens, revenue streams will revenue streams derived from the ICC, broadcast deals and sponsorships will, will dry up. This, this has a catastrophic impact on all things related to cricket. Professional players, men and women, club cricketers, varsity players, junior players, development of game, the administrators himself. There won't be a game to play, support or love. Jobs are on the line. So that just, I thought, provides quite a cool summary of what, what that, what's happening with the CSA. Um, and, you know, like... It's obviously a tough topic in terms of like management to chat about and pol- political aspects, um, but it couldn't seem to come at much worse of a time with the World Cup around the corner, eh? Yeah, the, the timing of it is quite strange. Um, well, not strange, it's what do you call it, um, so but they could have probably left it or, or made a plan with it till after the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I mean, it's just a little, you know, you can either see it as a hurdle or an obstacle or an opportunity. So, um, yes, maybe, I don't know who was wrong or right in that. Like I said to you earlier, my opinion on that really doesn't matter. It's, I'm yeah. not going to change what happens on that. So, um, 
obviously some of the stuff you read in the media is quite um, quite challenging and quite disturbing to read, and, and it does put a little bit of worry on you. But you know, at the end of the day, um, as a cricketer and as a player, your job is on the line every day. It's not you know, if you don't do your job, you could be dropped, you could lose your contract, etc. So just political stuff happening um, and political interference and and all you know, members councils and all that stuff. I mean, that's. Luckily, there's people in charge that get paid money to do those jobs and to sort that out. Um, yeah. So that's that's my opinion on it. I don't know in which context um, on you know Fudgy wrote that because he's a sucker, so a player's representative as well. He's a player, or is it individual capacity? Um, I'm not sure under which you know bracket that falls that he wrote that. Um, on from our side, from the Knights, look, we we hammer it down. At the nice, like we we want to play cricket. If you see someone in the street and they go, "Yeah, what are you guys doing in the cricket?" I'm like, "Well, what do you mean? We we train and we play. We've got nothing to do with, yeah. with what happens in offers." Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Um, again, like I know we, we we're sticking on media here, but there, there seems to be like a lot of in the last year. There's been a lot of chat around selection of various players and who plays where, and you know, like. Keyboard warriors, the chatting about who thinks who they is the best player in the world now. How have you managed to maybe block that out and, and stay as consistent as you had as you have been? Well, I've deleted Twitter. Point one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which my sponsors aren't very happy with because they use it <laughs> more. But yeah, so no, it's it's um, look what I what I don't understand with with. Um, media and supporters and, and all that is mm. we were all very critical of the Springboks, you know, going into the World Cup. And then mm. we won the World Cup, everyone is happy. And then that Chasing the Sun documentary came out that we all enjoy. oh like, oh, that's why we kicked the ball all the time. Yeah. Maybe it didn't work for, you know, against Italy and against all the teams that we lost yeah. um, into the tournament or in the build up you know, in Russia's two or three years. But there was a plan behind it and there is a growth behind it. So the media and the public, you know, the media, I feel, also has a responsibility in the product of Cricket South Africa. And they should be a shareholder in promoting the player and the team and the game in general. So if a guy gets if a guy gets out for 10 playing a shot and then the media is or article is, yeah, this guy got out with a bad shot playing across the line. Mm -hmm. But maybe that guy was sent in with a message to say, listen, you need to pull the trigger you know, two balls and then you got to go, you know, and he thought that's the option. They could have maybe written, you know, choose their words a little bit differently so the keyboard warrior on his couch reading the media statement yeah. doesn't see just Faf de Clark kicking the ball all the time. He sees, listen, that's the plan that they went with and maybe it didn't come off today, but if they're going to, you know, you can still have criticism, but you should be a shareholder in the product because if the product's crap, I mean, you're writing on a crap product, so yeah. you're not really helping the situation if you just bombard a player with um, with negative media all the time, or a coach, or even a team. Mm. I think maybe like the media needs to maybe shift the narrative of you know like oh it is it's in such turmoil, which it is, but like you know like if sure. if, if if a media is if media is writing good things, I mean, what the public reads about the media or what in the media is what they think is. Now yeah. that's so. I think maybe if, if there's a shift of narrative of like this guy's been picked, we maybe don't think it's the right call. But the, these are his stats, you know, like that that kind of thing. I think it would maybe change yeah. the the narrative. You know, if you, but, on. if you if you take a guy like Aidan Markham, for example, yeah, a year or two years ago, mm. the media was all over him. You know, he didn't get runs in India. He um, broke his hand. Um, now, look at what that guy wasn't even in the 2020 squad. Look at what he's done now in the last, let's call it, six or seven months. This guy has basically put his name in the hat to be one of the, probably at the moment, one of the 10 best players in the world. You know, yeah. I know we've played very limited cricket, but look at the way he's batting and look at what, what is happening. And what's it, eight, nine, ten months ago, a year ago, off the media, off the public were saying, oh, this guy, uh, uh, yeah, no. Nah. You know, Rassi van is a top five player in the world, or, you know, he was just around the corner top five player in the world. We've lost five or six guys to the IPL. Um, A.B. de Villiers is still in the wings. You know, we've got Chris Morris still. There's some serious players around. KG Rabada is, over a long period of time, probably one of the two or three best players in the world. Shamo is not. You know, so 
just because we're playing badly or it's not going our way or, you know, there's still some serious players. There are guys sitting on the bench that is year in, year out, performing and doing yeah. well and the national tournaments doing well. So the public, I, you know what, I actually hope the Pro Tiers do very well at the World Cup because I want to see some someone eat some humble pie, to be honest with you. Well, that, that was literally the next question. I was like, has, it, has there been a moment where something's been written about the team or you and you just prove them wrong and just like, you know what, like, your stuff you, know, you the, guys. The difficult, the difficult bit about, about my job is, well, our job is, yes, you can, like, yeah, you know, stuff you are just yeah. proved you wrong, but the next game you still have to go out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they back on, on you again. So it's probably best just to leave it, but... Mm-hmm. And not say anything and just get on with your job. But you know, if you if you you don't get a second rehearsal um, with cricket, you know that you get that ball, you miss it, you're out, or you you drop that catch, mm-hmm. and it's gone. That moment's gone. The guy sitting there writing the article, he can press backspace, he can clear his words, he can write it again, and it's not with 50 million people watching every keystroke he makes. You know, so. Yeah. Just, you know, think about it like that. If your job is under that pressure, you not you can't press backspace. You can't press clear, and 50 million people will judge whatever you've written there. I know I chose. We chose to play cricket, and I chose to be media. Yeah. But you know, sometimes you just got to think about it a little bit. So listen, let's sell. Let's sell the, the public a little bit. Uh, something better. Yeah. Mm. Like a different perspective, I think, because it's, it's all be negative. Um, but I'd love to pick up maybe on the, the whole AB and Chris Morris thing. I know you may be not at, at liberty to chat about it, which is absolutely no, fine. But what do you think? World Cup? Are they, are they coming? So my opinion, and this is personal opinion, this is nothing attached to any team I play for or selectors or anything like that. Like the call packs coming back, I feel they are South African. They've got South African passports. Yes, they've chosen to play cricket in a different country for a set time. Yeah. So for those two or three years or whatever it was, they were not allowed to play for South Africa. That's the price they had to pay. Now that that's finished, in my opinion. So if they are the best, and South Africa is a representation of our 11 best cricketers that we can pick, mm-hmm. they should be in contention. They should be playing, in my opinion. Yep. Plus, if you, if you feel as a player that, you know, this guy could take my spot. You know, if AB comes in, shit, but he's gonna come. He's gonna come for my spot. You shouldn't want that shirt if you're not the best, or if you don't think you're the best. You shouldn't want it if you think, mm-hmm. yeah, but AB is actually better than me. You know, AB can win us a World Cup. Why would you? You know, that's surely that's a bigger picture than than fight from Bullion getting five games, for example. AB winning a World Cup is surely bigger for 50, 60 million people in a country that's cricket is under the pressure. So my feeling with that is, is let's get the best guys that's got a South African passport in there playing and, well, fit and playing. So that's my opinion on that. Jeez, I, Pite, I, I would love just to have the Proteus win the World Cup and have another chase in the sun, pull out. Oh. Just, oh, just. Basically, they can have one-on-one interviews with all of us and we can go back onto those articles. Remember this? Yeah. <laughs> so you make your debut against Australia in Josie. How special was that? Um, and yeah, maybe take us through the day and the emotions felt. I know it, it must have been a childhood dream. 14 years yeah. of, of first-class cricket. Chat mm. us through it. Look, I don't know how other guys handled it, but when they told, when they told me just before the warm-up, um, I couldn't feel my legs in the warm-up. I don't remember anything of the warm-up. <laughs> Up until up until the national anthem, I don't even remember what, what I was singing when the national anthem. But as soon as the, as soon as the, we got into the game, I'd say probably I think Aaron Finch or someone cut the first ball for four, and then I was kind of like, okay, well, switched cool. on. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, it was a very tough game. They made over two hundred, and we were forty for seven when I was batting at the stage, mm. and. Um, there was there was thoughts going through my head that you know if I if I just scrap around here for a fifty we we're probably going to lose anyway so it's just you know yeah. a fifty yeah good luck and then there was another <laughs> another voice on my right shoulder saying listen buddy if you get a hundred here and you win <laughs> yeah let's go <laughs> then there's greatness you know so I kind of changed chased the greatness and it didn't work out and we got bowled out for like ninety so yeah it wasn't the most memorable game but we won the second one. 
and uh, we went into a decider in Cape Town where, again, we were in trouble early on. Um, and yeah, they obviously beat us in, in that game. So um, one day series I wasn't a part of, but I mean, the Aussies were at full strength. We were yeah. probably not at our full, full strength and we beat them in the one day series. And then England, just before that was a cracking series um, where every game went to the wire, wire with the World Cup against the World Cup winning team. So. I mean, I know the, the public and the media, again, they expect a South African team to win and to do well. But, you know, if we're competing against the best all the time, um, and I thought that was two cracking series to be a part of. Yeah. Well, it's, well, I just want to pick up on the Australia thing. You know, remember when they had the, the sandpaper game and then yeah. for like a year they were shit and everyone was like, this Australia side, yeah. so bad, so bad. Yeah. And then they released that Amazon, the test. I don't know if you watched it. Um, yep. Of like basically they're chasing the sun and now everyone yeah. like understands what happened and, and they're buying into it yeah 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 it's like crazy <laughs> but but you can't you can't do put a documentary out like that or a program out like that before you've had success because yeah. you have to wait until you have success and then give an explanation on god blanche on what happened yeah. you know in the build up and all the and all the crap you had to eat and and criticism you have to take but mm. yeah so it's about uh, them the coaching staff yes they like the media will not see how hard those guys works every there's no stone left unturned every session every day you know like two days ago i read, wrote, read an article on our fielding i wish like guys okay i know COVID, you can't but you, you must see the fielding exercises that the guys are doing and it's like an hour and a half full intensity you walk out there you need two days recovery after a fielding session like that so it's not like the coaches on the way like look we're a little bit behind in the fielding from where we want to be but yeah. they are so on it um and they're doing their job i mean it's not they don't not the ones going out there playing we're the ones going out there playing it's not Boucher's fault that that i dropped that catch at point it's it's my fault so you yeah. know yeah yeah Let, let's play a word game uh so the first word or yeah, a word that comes to your mind or phrase. Can you put a phrase there, yeah, please? One yeah. word will be Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> France is my first language and I'll be doing this in English. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, Bloom. Vegas. <laughs> Proteus. Hang in there. World Cup 2021. Um... Let me think. Go skip next one. Let's yeah. go next one. COVID nineteen. Over it. <laughs> Bio bubble. We'd rather get salmonella. <laughs> Night. Watch out. Okay. Nice. World Cup. Um oh, we we can get back to that. That's the last question, so maybe we can get back to that one. Um all right. But yeah, like I'd love just to chat about a little about performances um, and your kind of default reaction to maybe being up against your your back up against the wall um, and, and like really in it and not not firing. What 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 is, what is your kind of default reaction to it? And, and maybe can you give an example of maybe if you or the team were what was said in the change room or what was said individually? Yeah, I think it's it, it depends on. If it's personal and you're not performing personally, or maybe your back's against the wall in the game, um, it, it, it varies. You know, we are very lucky with Donald um, at the Knights. He's played at the highest level against some of the you know ESPN legends of cricket, and he's a, a legend of cricket. So it's very easy. For, well, we're very grateful that he, we walk into the change room and he knows exactly what to say. <laughs> You know, it'll either be a, a, a cracker up the bum or it'll be like, boys, let's just relax, let's just stay calm. But he knows exactly what to say. Um, personally, when I'm going through a bit of a patch um, in the past, I used to like just hammer down as many balls as I can. Um, we're now probably I'm a little bit older. I'm, I've learned how to keep the quality and focus on exactly what I have to do. Maybe go one gear down into my basics a little bit more and, and, and be clearer in what I want from myself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, from a, from a team environment, 
you're probably back against the wall every season. At some point, you're going to have no. a game that you lost or behind in a game. And then and then it depends on the personnel that's sitting in the change room and obviously who the coach is that, that how you get that message across. And in the 14 seasons, did you, can you, does one maybe stand out to you where you, where what was said in the change room really did change a, a mindset or a, like kick you into gear? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We played, um, Alan Donald was interim coach. I don't know. I can't remember in whose place, whether it was Nicky Bouillier's place or Alan Kruger's place, but he was interim coach in East London in a four day game. And we had a very good first innings and they were batting, batting, batting. We bowled them out. Um, and they followed on. So we had to obviously bowl them out again to try and get the win. Yes, and they were at tea time, day three, they were one down, 130 for one. We were bowling top of, we were bowling great. They were going at two and over. We were really like top of, off, top of, off, top of. Yeah. And we walked into the change room. Alan sat us down. He's like, okay, guys, um, you're bowling beautifully, but can you fucking do something different? <laughs> what you're doing now is not working. <laughs> Take up your fine leg, bowl a bouncer, put a leg slip in, let's think out the box here. The basics is not working. We've got to outsmart these guys now. <laughs> and that he you know, that guy thinks on a you know, every coach will tell you just stay top of off, just stay top of off. And he was just like, It's not working, it's yeah. too easy for them. Make a plan, bowl with a leg slip and try and get him out, you know, just think out the box. So that was brilliant. And another one we had was probably two games later where um, so usually the morning, if you've batted through the day and you've had a good day, the next morning the words will always be like, okay, let's watch this morning. They might come with some plans or the bowlers will be fresh again. And he said to us, we step on their necks in the first hour. They do not settle in the first hour. This is like a four-day game and he's talking like it's a <laughs> one day or a 2020. So he, like, he coaches at a different intensity. Yeah. So that's definitely raised my game as well, you know, in terms of putting opposition under pressure now. Yo, I love, I love those stories. Um, if one day someone was making a documentary of that guy's chats and changes, it is <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> yeah. What what separates you from other players, Pite? What do you, in your opinion? Your opinion? Probably a, a little bit of perseverance. Um, Drift, I've had probably a little bit longer than than some of the other guys through through some tough times. I've hanged in there probably a little bit more. Um, I like to prove people wrong. Um, I like to. I, I like to compete and to see how good I can be versus the best. So if it's a a KG bowling or a Rassi who's number one in the country, leading run scorer. I'd like to see how, how good I can or how close I can get to that. So yeah. um, if it's the opposition or if it's international cricket, I like to, you know, if I'm batting four or five, um, whoever's four or five for the opposition, I like to probably outperform him and, and see how good I can be against these best bowlers. So I wouldn't say it sets me apart, but I think that's, that's probably what's kept me in the game for so long now. Yeah. 1800s, 3650s, and a high score of 202. How do you feel when you're at your best? And, and how do you try to replicate that? Yes, it's difficult in cricket because there's so many variables the pitch, the bowlers, um, your own form. Um, how do I replicate that? It's, I've gone, again, I've gone from a training regime where very much hitting a lot of balls, the basics, etc to over the last two or three years probably putting myself under pressure in the nets and putting myself under pressure when I train. Mm. Um, probably put the bowling machine a little bit quicker, ask the coach to come a little bit closer when there's throwdowns, um, ask the bowlers to take new balls, for example. So always trying to put myself under a little bit more pressure um, because I know the, the next 19-year-old is coming. He's coming through and, and he'll have video analysis when he was 13 and oh, we yeah. only analysis when I was 30. So I always know, look, the next guy is coming and, and I have to make sure that that spot, that I'm the best guy for that spot. And the only way I can do that is to challenge myself. Yeah. Okay. And the last one, the final one, will we see Pied van Bullion as a World Cup winner at the end of this year? I don't know. Maybe you can ask Victor Bitsang, he's the selector. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think my, my opinion on, on where we are in world cricket, obviously in rankings and in past performances, it's not looking great. But FAF is drilling them at the IPL. 
mm-hmm. AB's in some serious form. Russ is a top five, but Quinny's coming good now. 2020 cricket's about form, man. Huh? We'll see. Individuals on form. That's what 2020 cricket's about. It's, it, it, it's all it's all shape enough to be a perfect storm as a, as like a chase in the sun and, and you know like what i love about um like t20 cricket is that yeah you could have had a, a crap year um but at the end of the day it's 20 overs it's not like it, it can change so quickly and i think that's a uh, crap competition and a semi-final you get 50 of 20 you win the game for them yeah yeah wow. i love it i i I know I read I read a lot of the articles, but I do genuinely believe that we we have a serious uh, chance to win this, um, and, I, and I hope to see Pite there. I, I genuinely do. We flipping insane. Um, but yeah, Pite, thanks so much for joining me. I've really appreciated it, and the time's oh, flown by. Um, yeah, it's been such a flipping awesome chat. I know when I told yeah. guys I was I was doing you, he, a lot, all of them just said, just ask about the process, ask about uh, like getting opinions. So I was like, you know what, I have to, and I think you've provided that. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. It was a good one.